welcome all the guests that are here today. We're glad you're here to worship with us today. Um, we're excited about what God is doing in this church. How many are excited? And uh, what he's doing in the churches in this whole region. God's moving. The churches are growing. Ten years ago, you can't say that, right? There, there was Ten years ago, there was a lot of struggles with a lot of the churches. Today, most of the churches are growing uh, because people are praying. Amen? So just to encourage you that your prayers are, 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 are doing something. It's all good. So today, I want to talk about guardrails. Guardrails. We started a series, we started a series um, last week, and we talked about what guardrails were. And today, we're going to talk a little bit about how we relate them to our friendships, Amen. How many know you need guardrails in your friendships? So, Father, I thank you, Lord, that you would lead me in the teaching today. I ask, God, that we'd have ears to hear and um, eyes to see what your word is saying to us today. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. And so a guardrail, what is a guardrail? A guardrail uh, is a system designed to keep vehicles from straying into dangerous off-limit areas. That's what a guardrail is. Last week I talked about when I was in my early 20s, probably the late teens, early 20s. I can't remember the exact time, but I was driving down the 401 in my car, and I dozed off, and I woke up by hitting the guardrail. Well, I hit the guardrail, and boom, 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 and I opened up, and I pulled back, and I realized that that guardrail was there to direct and to protect me, right? And so it protected me and protected the oncoming traffic from a bad situation. How many would agree? Right? Uh, so guardrails are important to protect us. And the thing with guardrails is that they're found in the most potentially dangerous areas. Okay? So if you're going down the road and there's a dangerous cliff, there's usually a guardrail. And guardrails protect us um, from the danger zones. Okay? Uh, guardrails are never in the danger zone. They're always just before the danger zone. Okay? And uh, one of the examples I gave last week as well is I took my kids to Beaker's Point conservation area out uh, near the Niagara region there. We're, we're walking along these paths and we came to these cliffs and uh, the path goes along the cliff edge and it's 100, 100 feet to 100 meters at different places. It's very high and we're walking along the cliff edge and there were no guardrails. And how many know when you have little kids, all of a sudden you're like panicking because you're like, uh, don't go near the cliff, don't go near the cliff. I had some pictures I wanted to send but I forgot to put them up. But the kids were, were you know, just walking like this carelessly along the edge, and I was just panicking because I, I realized they didn't realize the danger zone and how dangerous it was. So guardrails are really important, okay? And last week we asked, what would it be like to have guardrails so strong and so established in our lives that when we bump up against them, it would alert our conscience? How many of we talked about that? And our greatest regrets could have probably been avoided if we had some financial, if we had some moral, if we had some relational and professional guardrails in our lives. And so we have to have guardrails, okay? Um, the whole thought leads us to this new definition for guardrails, and that is this. Guardrails are a standard of behavior that become a matter of conscience. Guardrails are a standard of behavior that becomes a matter of conscience, Okay? And so what that means is that your conscience is actually triggered before you go into the danger zone, right? Sometimes people, you know, they're living life and they think everything's great. And the next thing you know, they find themselves in bed with somebody and their conscience goes off and they say, what happened? I feel terrible. I shouldn't have done this. How about if you would have put guardrails in your life so that you never get to that place? How many hear what I'm saying? And I gave an example last week for myself. I made a decision not to be drive alone with a woman in the car in a vehicle unless my wife or someone else is there because first of all it looks bad and then it puts me in a compromising situation how many here and so if a woman jumps in my car to go for a ride my conscience goes crazy how many hear what i'm saying or i've made a decision not to if i'm counseling a woman it's we have a door open policy and there's usually someone else there but if a woman comes into my office and pastor i want you to counsel me and shuts the door my conscience goes crazy. So I've set up a guardrail so my conscience is triggered when that happens so that I don't end up in the ditch. How many hear what I'm saying? So God wants us to set up, set up a guardrails in our lives to protect us from compromise, okay? And um, I wanted to talk today about why can't we be friends? The whole guardrail system around friendships, okay? Um, when we were kids, how many remember when you were a kid? All right. Some of you don't want to, okay? Our, our, parents, our parents were um, fanatical about who we spent time with. 
And I remember that as a child. My, my parents really were concerned about uh, who I hung out with. And there was times where I got in with the wrong kids and my parents said, okay, we're, we're moving schools. And they pulled me out of a school and put me in another school. Okay? Maybe some of you have experienced that. Okay? You're, you, you're moved from one school to another. Uh, you, know, you move from one community to the next. Okay? Uh, my parents would have arranged my marriage if, if they could have. Right? I mean, how many know what I'm talking about? Because we're concerned about our children. And you know, now we grow up and we have our own kids, my wife and I, and we're worse. We say, oh, we'll never be like our parents. But now, now we're completely different. We have electronic surveillance systems. You know, we check their Facebook. Who's their friends? You know, who are they, who are they on Instagram with? We're kind of like watching them like Big Brother, right? Why? Because we understand the same thing our parents understood, and that is this, that um, um, friends will determine the outcome and direction and quality of your kids' lives. Okay? The friends they hang out with will, out, it will determine the quality and direction of their lives. And it's so important when we understand this principle, we realize how important it is to choose our friends wisely and make sure we're hanging around wise people. Okay? The things that make friendship wonderful are often the things that make them dangerous. Okay? Why? Because once we feel people accept us, we drop our guards, right? And, and because we crave acceptance. As human beings, we want to be accepted, we want to be loved. So when we get with someone who accepts us and cares for us. We drop our guards. And the next thing you know is that we're open to their influence. Okay? And so friendships can be a beautiful thing, but they can also be a dangerous thing. How many here, did anyone here smoke their first cigarette alone? Okay? If you smoked, right? No. I remember the first time I smoked a cigarette was with a friend. Hey, man, you got to try this. And we went and we hit it behind a tree. And it was kind of, it wasn't with an enemy. It was with a friend that I dropped my guard. Okay? Um, a lot of addictive behavior begins in a crowd. It beca- begins because we're, we want acceptance from someone or from a crowd, so we begin to compromise our convictions so that we can fit in. That's how addictive behaviors begin, okay? Our greatest regrets were m- mainly with, with friends and not with enemies. How many would agree with that? Okay? That's where the compromise comes, okay? Your friends will influence the direction and the quality of of your life. And this works both ways in the good and in the bad. So it's important to choose your friends wisely. Okay? Um, this is the nature of friendship. Now I want to look at a couple of scriptures. Proverbs 13, verse 20, if we can bring it up. It says, Walk with the wise and become wise, for a, com- a companion of fools suffers harm. Okay? Walk with the wise and become wise. Let's say it together. Walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers harm, okay? The scripture contains a promise here, and it contains a warning. Here's the promise. You become wise by doing life with wise people. This is a principle, okay? Wisdom is contagious. Wisdom will rub off on you, all right? Uh, When you walk with and do life with people who are wise, you become that's, this is what the scripture is telling us. Wise people understand this, that life is connected, and they live and act accordingly. Today's decisions are connected to tomorrow's outcomes, so they decide today based on tomorrow. So wise people realize that today's decisions will affect tomorrow's outcomes, right? And so where you are today in your life is because of a series of decisions that maybe your parents... Uh, your family and you have made a series of decisions have brought you to where you are today. And wise people understand that. Okay? And so here's the difference. The warning is this in this verse. Okay, you run the risk of something bad happening to you if you run with fools. This is a warning. This is where the deception lies. You tell yourself, I'm not really like those people so I can hang out with them. All right? You tell yourself, since I'm not as bad, wild, or freaky as they are, I'll be okay in their company. And you deceive yourself because you want acceptance, but what happens is you begin to compromise. So the warning is not that the companion of fools become a fool. It's that the shrapnel of their lives will injure you. Right? And th- this is important when you understand this principle. A fool in Proverbs is someone, okay, who knows right from wrong but doesn't care. That's what a fool is. 
He or she lives as if life is connected. Today is today, is today. tomorrow is tomorrow. What I do, I'm just going to have fun today. I'm going to enjoy my life today, and I don't care about the results tomorrow. That sums up a foolish person. A wise person realizes my decisions today will affect tomorrow's outcomes. So this is the difference, okay? And so here's the warning. The warning has to do with proximity, okay? When we eventually go down, you go down with them because you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I remember when I was 14, I was out with one of my cousins. I'm not going to tell you which one, in case you know him. And I was young. I was maybe 13. And, and I was with my cousin who was 15. No, I was 14. He was 15. And he was with his buddy. And we went into Sears. And he goes, hey, let's go look at clothes. And back in the early 90s, um, Polo Ralph Lauren was really popular with the teens. It still is today. But we went in. So he grabbed these Ralph Lauren shirts and stuff. And he said, I'm going to try this on. And his buddy said, yeah. So I'm, I said, I'll just wait outside the change room. And they went into the change room. And then they came out. And I looked at him and said, do you gain weight? Something's wrong here, right? And where's your clothes? And I realized it wasn't in the change room. And I thought, they're like, come on, guys, let's walk. And so I'm walking with my, these, my cousin and his friend. I'm like, this isn't good, man. I'm going to get busted. And so, so we, get, we, get out of the, we get out of the, we get out of Sears and we're walking through the mall. And then this mall cop runs up. Paul Ballard comes running behind me. That's just a joke if you've seen the movie Mall Cop. But this, this guy comes up and he tackles me to the ground. And I'm like, what did I do? What did I? And he goes, and, and I, we got pulled in, arrested and all this. Like I was 13, so I was let off. Um, you know, I just had to turn them in and give, you know, you know, betray them and everything. And I did that. It was fine. I had nothing to do with it. I said, yeah, they did it all. I had nothing to do with it. And yeah. And, you know, it's... So anyway, the thing, is, the thing is here, you know, I was at the wrong place at the wrong time. I was hanging out with people who were doing foolish things. And that's what happens when you hang around foolish people. The shrapnel of their lives will affect you. Okay? Friends who aren't careful with their lives will not be careful with your life. Friends who, friends who are not, uh, who don't take care of themselves, they're not going to take care of you. Friends who, uh, who, who are irresponsible with their finances will not be... Uh, will be irresponsible with yours. This is, this is a, the principle here. Friends who don't mind abusing their bodies don't mind if you abuse yours. Friends who cheat will feel better about themselves if you follow suit. All right? Friends who break the law won't confront you about breaking the law. And so friends can be dangerous, and danger requires guardrails. You need to establish a standard that informs your conscience when you start to veer. Your lights should start to go off. And this is so important. Your conscience should light up when it dawns on you that your core group isn't moving in the direction that you want to go. Your conscience will go, hey, they're not moving where I want to go. Maybe I need to pull back. If you catch yourself pretending to be someone other than who you really are, I was a master of that. I, w- I was in high school, like I-, I hung out with, you know, skaters, and then I hung out with metal, rock metal band guys and then I hung out with the preps I hung I just fit in with everyone hey who wants to go out and I would dress accordingly and I'd go out and I'd just become that person I had so many different I didn't know who I was you know because I wanted to just have acceptance everywhere and so what I did was I wasn't being myself I was compromising okay Uh, your conscience should light up when you feel pressure to compromise okay your 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 conscience should light up when you hear yourself saying I'll go but I'm not going to participate Your conscience should light up when you say, you know, I hope people who I care about the most won't find out what I'm doing or where I've been. These are all signs that you're with the wrong people. And it's very important. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 33 says, Do not be deceived and misled. Evil companionship corrupts good manners and morals and character. How many would agree with that? And Proverbs chapter 22, verse 24 to 25 says, don't befriend angry people, okay? Uh, don't befriend angry people or associate with hot-tempered people, or you will learn to be like them and endanger your soul, right? Don't befriend angry people. You have to have guardrails. Next verse, Proverbs 25, verse 17. Don't visit your neighbor too often or you will wear out your welcome. 
I remember when I had a, my best friend in high school, I hung out with him every day, and I would show up at his house every day, and his mother and dad and his brother and sister were there. Every day I would come over, and I was a teenager, and I ate a lot. And I would come for supper every night. I would invite myself. And they were so friendly and nice, and they made me feel welcome, so I'd just keep doing it. I kept coming, yeah, they love me. This is great. We're going to hang out. My new second family. And one day I show up, and I, I ring the doorbell, and, and, and Sheila, the mother, does a, a tuck and roll. She, I, see, I see corner of my eye. She's like, she sees me, and she's like, Poof, and, she, and she tucks. I'm like, did I just see, did I see someone do a, a tuck and roll? What's going on here? And I'm knocking, and I'm ringing the doorbell, and the car's locked up in the garage. I'm thinking, something's going on here, right? And I realize the light went on. Uh, I think I'm out wearing my welcome, and they don't want to tell me, right? And so I, I, at that point, I stopped visiting so much, right? Um, but we can't wear it our welcome, all right? So, um, so I, I have a couple questions I want to, two questions we want to answer before we close this sermon, okay? What does a true friend look like? That's the first thing. And the second thing I want to talk about is what attracts you to certain people? Two things. So the first one is what does a true friend look like? The word friend, actually, from the 1828 Noah's Webster Dictionary, I like to go back and, because the English language has just kind of evaporated, so I like to go back to 100 years ago, 200 years ago. It's one who's attached to another by affection, who has entertained, who entertains for, uh, for another sentiments of esteem, respect, and affection, which leads him to desire his company and to seek to promote his happiness and prosperity. Okay, so a true friend esteems you. Say, esteems you. A true friend shows respect and pure affection. Say respect and pure affection. And number three, seeks to promote your happiness and prosperity. Say it. Seeks. Not just your happiness, but your prosperity. Sometimes you have to say something. If you truly care about somebody, you'll have to tell them the truth because you want them to prosper. And it might affect their happiness temporarily, but you know what? You have to address it because you care, because you realize that tomorrow's results are determined on the decisions they make today. So you have to address certain things, and it's hard to do that, but a true friend will do that. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, okay? But the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. All right? And so when a friend really cares, he'll come and say, you know what, your life's out of order. Or you shouldn't be in this relationship or you shouldn't be doing this. And you say, well, I, you don't judge me. No, I'm not judging you. I care about your tomorrow. I want you to prosper. I want you to do well. And so a good sign that you're hanging out with the right people is that when your friends will actually correct you and rebuke you, that's a good sign. It's a good sign when your pastor or your boss or any leaders that you're around will stop and say, hey, there's an area in your life that needs to be adjusted. Why? Because wise people care about tomorrow because they realize today's decisions determine it. Does this make sense to anybody today? In Proverbs 25, verse 17 this is, uh, we already did that one. Proverbs 27, verse 17, as iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. And that's what friendship is about. Friendship is not just about caring about people's happiness. It's caring about their prosperity. Jesus says it best. I love how Jesus says it. In John chapter 15, verse 12 to 15, he says this. This is my commandment. He's talking to his disciples. That you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do whatever I command you, no longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I call you friends. For all things that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. You might not have to lay down your physical life for someone, but you might have to lay down your, um, your pride or your need for acceptance to bring direction to someone. That's what a true friend does. Amen? Um, so a friend, what is a friend? Let's, let's see here. i got my notes here. Because I'm still learning it too. Say, a friend is someone who esteems you, shows respect and pure affection, and seeks to promote your happiness and prosperity. Now, an acquaintance is a person 
whom you know, but who is not particularly close. A casual acquaintance. And here's the issue is that a lot of people are friends with people that really should be acquaintances. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because they don't care for your life. The principle of friendship is also found in Amos. It says, can two walk together except they agree? Friends are of like mind. The truth that comes from all of this is that friendship is a relationship that is entered into individuals. Now, here's the thing. You make friends, because here's the second question is, why are we attracted to certain people? You make friends with people who are like-minded. Say like-minded. Okay? Like-minded people you'll be attracted to. But what, what, what if you've become a new creature? What if the Bible's true when it says, all things have passed away, behold, all things have become new. God's spirit has taken up in residence within you. How many think different now as a believer than you did before you believed? How many, see your hands, okay? So, so here's the question. Uh, if you've become a new creature, new creatures have a different diet. Right? So, so the caterpillar crawls on the leaves and it eats the leaves and it eats the grass and it ends up metamorphosizing and turning into a butterfly. And a butterfly doesn't eat leaves. A butterfly eats nectar. And so what happens with a lot of people when they become Christians, all right, they've become new creatures in Christ. They begin to eat a new heavenly diet, which is the word of God. They think differently. They act differently. And they try to hold on to old relationships and the diet's different. And what happens is because they're renewing their mind with the word of God, because they're, they're being transformed, this hindrance comes into their spiritual growth because they're holding on to friendships that are no longer compatible. And you can't hold on to friendships that are no longer compatible. Now, I want to say this. The Bible says that we're to love our enemies. So that means you have to love all people and you have to care for people. But I'm talking about being a heart-to-heart -heart friend with somebody. I think every Christian should have a, a, a bunch of uh, people who don't believe in God so they can be in their life and befriend them and show them what Jesus looks like and love on them. But I'm talking about heart-to-heart, -heart, sharing your heart, drawing and caring for one another. You need to have good, solid Christian friends that are like-minded. Say like-minded. All right? And I want to look here for a minute at a beautiful example in the scripture of David and Jonathan. How many know David and Jonathan? Now, now we hear a lot about David, but we don't hear a lot about Jonathan. Now, David, this is 1 Samuel 18, verse 1 to 4. It says, after David finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan, the king's son. There was an immediate bond between them, for Jonathan loved David. From that day on, Saul kept David with him, and he wouldn't let him return home. And Jonathan made a solemn pact with David because he loved him as he loved himself. Jonathan sealed the pact by taking off the, his robe and giving it to David, together with his tunic, sword, bow, and belt. So he entered into covenant with David because he loved him like he loved himself. And here we have a picture of a true friendship. How many see that? An intimate friendship. But, and so what happens is now Jonathan is best friends with David, and Jonathan's father, Saul, wants to kill David. But Jonathan defends David to his father in 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 4 to 7. I'm going to read that. It says, the next morning, Jonathan uh, spoke with his father about David, okay, saying many good things about him. The king must not sin against his servant David, Jonathan said. He's never done anything to harm you. He's always helped you in any way he could. Have you forgotten about the time he risked his life to kill the Philistine giant and how the Lord brought a great victory to Israel as a result? Next verse. Okay, You were certainly happy about it then. Why should you murder an innocent man like David? There's no reason for this at all. Okay, Do another verse there. Yeah. So Saul listened to Jonathan and vowed, as surely as the Lord lives, David will not be killed. And afterwards, Jonathan called David and told him what had happened. And then he brought David to Saul, and David served in the courts as before. And so you see here this relationship where Jonathan is taking care of David's future. He cares about David's prosperity. Okay. Um, but we know about David. 
even those who don't, you know, maybe haven't read a lot of the Bible, they've heard about David and Goliath. How many have heard David and Goliath? And so we've heard this story about this little boy who's a teenager who goes out and he has this courage that nobody else has. All of Israel and all the mighty men and the prophets are sitting there going, I don't know, man, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? This giant's going to kill us. He's going to take us out. What are we going to do? And this teenage boy shows up and goes, who's this idiot who's, who's defying? He's defying the God of Israel. Let me kill him. I, let me out. And they're like, no, no, you're not big enough. You're not tough enough. Here, take some armor. And he's like, no, just let me go. I'm going to go. God will do, I've seen God deliver me. He delivered me when the, the bear came to destroy my flock. God gave me power, and I killed the bear, and I killed the lion. He's talking about the greatness of God. So David was a man of faith. Say man of faith. And, there's not, and, and so he needed to find someone who was like-minded so that he could have an intimate relationship. And so what I wanted to do is I want to take a look at Jonathan. Because a lot of people don't talk about Jonathan. But even before David met Goliath, Jonathan was having encounters with God and understood that God was a God of breakthrough. And look what happened here. How many know that the Philistines and Israel were always fighting together? And they were going to war. And the, the, the Philistines were here, and Israel was here, and they're about to, and, and again, the Israelites are sitting back waiting on a word from God. What should we do? What should we do? The Philistines are attacking. And Jonathan gets tired of waiting. And look what happens in the next verse here. Um, One day Jonathan said to his armor bearer, okay, we won't put up that scripture yet because that's down the road. One day Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come on, let us go over to where the Philistines have their outpost. But Jonathan did not tell his father what he was doing. Meanwhile, Saul and his 600 men were camped on the outskirts of Gibeah, around the pomegranate tree at Migron. Among Saul's men was Ahijah the priest, who was wearing an ephod, the priestly vest, and uh, a whole bunch of other weird people, uh, names, not weird people, weird names. And the priest of the Lord, who had served in Shiloh, was there also. Next verse, no one realized that Jonathan had left Israelites' camp. Nobody knew he left. But he had decided, I'm tired of waiting, I'm going to go do something. So he left to reach the Philistine outpost. Jonathan had to go down between two rocky cliffs that were called Bozes and Sina. The cliff on the north was in the front, and the one on the south was in front of Geba. Let's go down to the outpost of, the, uh, of those pagans, Jonathan said to his armor bearer. Look what he says here. This is where you can bring up the verse here. Okay, he says, let's go to the outpost of these pagans. He's talking to his armor bearer. Jonathan said, Perhaps the Lord will help us, for nothing can hinder the Lord. He can win a battle whether he has many warriors or only a few. And the armor bearer says, do what you think is best, the armor bearer replied. I'm with you completely, whatever you decide. And so here you see the heart of Jonathan. Jonathan is like, hey, listen, I heard of Gideon and how he destroyed the army with 300 men. Hey, listen, God can do whatever God wants to do. He's bigger. And I'm just going to go in faith. He had the same heart. He had the same like-mindedness of David. He, had, he was a man of faith. Okay? And look at verse 8. Okay. All right, then, Jonathan told him. We will cross over and let's see uh, and let them see us. If uh, they say to us, stay where you are or we'll kill you, then we will stop and not go after them. But if they say, come on up and fight, then we will go up. That will be a sign that the Lord will help us defeat them. Okay, now, I want you to understand this picture here because this, this, is, um, this is two men against an army. 600 of the, the men that uh, make up the army of Israel are staying back, but Jonathan and his arm bearer are moving forward. Okay? Verse 11, then the Philistines saw them coming. They shouted, look, the Hebrews are crawling out of their holes. And then the men from the outpost shouted to Jonathan, come on up here and we'll teach you a lesson. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, for the, the Lord will help us defeat them. Let's go. Now that's crazy faith. Say crazy faith. He was like David, like-minded. Look what happens. So they climbed up using both hands and feet, and the Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer, killed those who came from behind. They killed 20 men in all, and their bodies were scattered over about half an acre. Suddenly because they stepped out in faith. Panic broke out in the Philistine army, both the camp and in the field, including the outposts and the raiding parties. And just then the earthquake struck and everyone was terrified and the armies began to turn against each other, the Philistines, and they fought each other. And I'm not going to read the whole passage, but back at the camp, Saul goes, 
I hear a war. There's, there's something going on. Who's left our number? And they counted everybody. They did a toll. So Jonathan and his armor bearer are gone. And the army was defeated that day because two men were, had crazy faith. How many see that? All right. And so what happened was, was when, when David met with Jonathan, they both had crazy faith like mindedness. So Jonathan's like, oh, finally, a friend who actually understands God the way I understand God. And Jonathan's like, yeah, you, you, you understand faith. And, and, and they could talk and they could relate and they could trust and they can build. The relationship was compatible. How many see that? And so I'll give you an example. When I transitioned from an employee to an entrepreneur to be an employer back in 2009, before that I was always working for somebody. And I was working for a window company in, in, in Kingston, uh, had a great boss, had a great job. I enjoyed being an employee, had no problem with that. But I would get laid off every year because we were in the window business. And it, from Christmas till probably May or April, I had no work. And I had to draw unemployment. So I did it for two years, but it was tough financially. So I called my boss and said, listen, I, you've been a great boss, but I'm going to start my own business. And he said, go for it. May the Lord bless you. He was a Christian. So, you know, I took, so I started my own business. But what I did was I, I, I still hung out with my employee friends. We'd go out. And my employee friends would go, yeah, you know, they say in five years, 80% of all businesses flop. And I'm like, really? Yeah, I wouldn't want to run a business, man. You know, I'd rather work for someone else. Let them do all the dirty work, you know, and blah, 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 blah. And next thing you know, I got discouraged, man. I was like, I might be one of the 80%. I might flop, you know. And I started to get discouraged. I started to get, like, I was not able to build my business. But then I started meeting people, and, I, and I, they said, you need to join a networking business. So I joined, well, first I joined BNI, and then there's a couple other, there was another one that I joined. And I started getting together with people who were starting businesses. And they would, they would say, hey, you know, this is what I've done, and this is how I've been, be, been successful in advertising or in promoting or in hiring. Uh, this is how I do my interviews. And I'd be like, yeah, cool, right? And then I would share with them, and we would network together, and we had something in common. How many hear what I'm saying? And so, so what happened was uh, I had faith to build my business because I was hanging out with entrepreneurs. And so there had to be a transition in my relationships to go to the next level in my life. So do I still like my employee friends? Yes. Do I still hang out with them? Yes. But I'm not going to go heart to heart with them because they don't understand where I'm going because I'm moving from glory to glory to glory. And if people don't want to move from glory to glory with you, you got to love them, but you got to keep moving. How many hear what I'm saying? Okay? And um, this new network began to encourage me, to support me, and um, I build my faith for business, and, and I began to transition my mindset, so I had to have a relationship with them. And then I remember Peter Skibo, who was my, uh, my teacher when I went to the business school, uh, he told me this. He asked me the question. He asked the class, and I thought I was cool. I thought I had the right answer, but he said, I have a question for you, Travis. I said, what is it? He goes, if you have uh, a customer call you and say, I need you to come and do this job. I need you to do it on Saturday night. And you're supposed to do it on Monday, but he's asking you to do it Saturday night. He said, but you have planned to go out with your wife and kids on Saturday night. Do you prioritize the customer, who's new, by the way, or do you prioritize your family? And I thought, yeah, I know what. Well, I'll just tell my, I'll explain to my family. We'll have to postpone it because I have to... Business is important. And he rebuked me. He stopped me and said, no, no. He goes, you can get new customers. You can never get a new family. Or it's hard to get a new family. And so he, he was like, no, your family has to be first. And I, I'm a pastor, too. And I'm sitting there going, yeah, I know. You know, like kind of, I'm embarrassed, right? Um, but he said, because you got to take care of your family. And you got to pour into your family. And explain it to your customers, but do never put them before your family. And so that was kind of his encouragement. Um, so... Maybe there's some of you in this place that you've been struggling, but, and I want to say this very carefully because you don't, you want, you want to love people, you want to have friendships with people, but I'm talking about being close friends. And maybe God is calling you to transition. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why at this church we have what we call connect groups throughout the week where people in the church can connect and they can build relationships and they can talk, they're like-minded now. They can talk about the things of God. They can talk about where they're going in life. And it, and it helps you grow spiritually when you're with like-minded people. Amen? I have some family members that I love dearly, 
uh, in my extended family that are not Christians. I still love them. I still go to their homes. I still visit them. But I can't have the heart-to-heart -heart talks anymore because we're on different planets when it comes to spiritual things. How many hear what I'm saying? So those relationships are still there. They're still important. I still love on them. But it, my closest friends are, are those that are walking the walk I'm walking. So why don't we stand in prayer today? I'm just going to pray. How many would say this message spoke to your heart today? Let me just see your hand. Well, just pray with me. Say, Heavenly Father, help me to evaluate and to hear your voice concerning the friends that I have. And Lord, help me to put guardrails in place that you will help me to identify that I'll be able to stay out of the danger zone. Help me to, to be around wise people Understanding that today's decisions will affect tomorrow's outcomes. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God is good. Well, that's my message for today. And uh, it's kind of a tough one because God starts talking to us about who we're hanging out with. And like I said, again, I, I believe, and I want to make this very clear, that as G, we, our model here at the church, what we say is we want to model Jesus. We want to share his love. And so Jesus hung around with sinners. He sat and had dinner with them. He talked with them. So in no way am I saying have no relationship with sinners. I'm saying get close to people, but make sure your close, intimate friends are those who have like-mindedness in where you're going. Amen? Whether it's business, whether it's church, whatever it is, in Jesus' name. We'll be blessed and enjoy the rest of the day.